Podcasting from Astrolab Studios, this is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we revisit sci-fi fantasy and just plain weird shows that have faded from the collective consciousness and didn't quite make the impact that they intended. This week, Space Above and Beyond, episodes 12 and 13. Monitor. Who monitors the birds? I monitor the birds. Who monitors you? Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that is ready to take on the second half of Space Above and Beyond. I'm Luke, here with my pal and co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? I, I, I'm always amused by what's real. I, it's not even that funny, but I just, I really, I'm really tickled by it every time. I'm, gl- I'm glad you like it. What's real? I, I wish more people would, would use tech war lingo in everyday speech. I mean, if we keep pushing, it'll happen. Yeah, once, once this podcast uh, really hits the masses, the kids are going to start saying it. And once the kids say it, that's it. Game over. Yeah, once the kids rediscover tech war. You know, stranger things have happened. Hey, it's true. And we've got the recast ready to go for when it happens. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping here. In the last episode we did with Courtney, um, I realized I didn't take a quick moment to check the Continuum Drag computers to make sure we were still good without the, using the escape pod. I mean, I think we know we're pretty safe. Yeah. But what what are we at? Do you know? Um, so yeah, at the end of the last episodes on Seismo Beyond, we were averaging out at 6.46. So we're, we're above operating averages, I think. What does that come to if we were in school? Is that a C? C minus? That's a good question. I don't know. I never had letter grades. I actually don't know if it's that good a question. (laughs) Um, but yeah, uh, for those listeners who don't remember, uh, if the show falls below an average of five across the whole series, we are, uh, we're, we'll abandon that via the escape pod. But right now, I'd say we're in pretty good shape. Um, but yeah, I, I realize I've been forgetting to do that. So I'm going to try to be more on top of it. That's all right. I, th- I think we're probably pretty safe anyways. I'm actually a little surprised it's as low as it is. I expected it to be a much higher for some reason, but it's actually kind of been a little mediocre. Well, I think we've said it before, um, at least in my opinion, is that the show has a lot of the elements to make it a successful show and an entertaining show it just sort of keeps missing the mark for one way in one way or another um or they have a really fun episode and then they follow it up with a couple that are kind of seem filler episodes so that i i just feel like we're now 12 13 in and they still sort of haven't really hit their stride at least that's how i feel all right if we're gonna get this podcast properly started now i think you need to brace yourself oh i'm braced i'm braced go because we're about to dock with the Space Above and Beyond fan base. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm interested to see what you found because um, I, I've done a little bit of, of looking around and some of it was kind of interesting and some of it was kind of gross. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll hear what you have to say about it too. But I, I did a, just kind of a brief overview of kind of who's still talking about it and like what's happening with people interested in the show still. There's a very active Facebook group and Twitter account, which seem to be run by the same person. The Facebook group has about uh, 2,200 people in it. The Twitter account is very, very active and claims to be the official feed of Space Mum Beyond. Can, can, you, can you be the official feed if there's no one actually that worked on the show you know, involved? I guess that's how he's doing it, is no one is left involved with the show, so it's just him. Right, right. Okay. And then, of course, there's like a subreddit. It's actually pretty inactive. There's a few little things here and there, but there's only like 54 subscribed users. But pretty much across the board, all these places are pretty much made up of like birthdays for the actors, little pieces of nostalgia people like to post. Um, Occasionally, they'll they'll drop some episodes or they'll do a news article that's from like 94. I I do know that from what I've seen, um, it doesn't seem to be a large fan base, but the people who liked it, really really like it and there's they seems to be quite a little passionate group and you only ever really see positive things it's not like some of the other shows where people mention tech war as kind of a you know a 
joke or or beyond westworld is this thing how did it exist but this show people do seem to have genuinely liked it if you know obviously maybe weren't a big enough group when it uh when it was actually airing yeah it's definitely beloved and has become a bit legendary that's for sure one one little note i noticed on the facebook group in addition to all those other posts there also seems to occasionally be just posts about uh current geopolitics or military events which is really weird when interspersed amongst uh whose birthday it was last month uh, one thing I noticed, not to intercut on your segment, but obviously a lot of people who are military enthusiasts, people who love guns and love space guns and drawing like laser guns, those people love this show. Yeah, I think when it comes to military science fiction, this is like the go to. This is the TV show that exists for them. Right. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it, 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 it definitely is that. It's And weirdly, I should say, it's probably the stuff I like the least of the show is when it gets really hardcore military. I'm not as interested, but yeah, teach their own. I don't mind it. I, I, I don't have a passion for that, but I always enjoy something that's very specific into a niche like that. So now I kept digging a little bit and I kind of came across, I think, kind of the origin of the fan base for Space Month Beyond. OK. Between like 96 and 2000, there seemed to have been a like pretty active fanzine community. Nice. Like a lot of like like black and white hand drawn magazine sort of thing. Yeah. Like these were published and bound copies of books that were passed around and sold, I guess, in early internet. And they would be either made up of, like, news stories about what the cast is doing now, or there would be, like, fan fiction put into them. Hmm. Obviously, that means there was actually a few books that were, in fact, like, slash fiction, or a new term I learned, het fiction. Sorry, what's the term? Het fiction? I've never heard that before. What is What does that stand for? I, I think it just means heterosexual. Uh, oh, wait. Heterosexual fiction? Yeah, well, do you know what slash fiction is? Yeah. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It just seems... Anyways. Well, I think it's just to distinguish itself from slash fiction. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess guess that makes sense. Well, I don't know why I'm surprised. Just different strokes for different folks, Jordan. Yeah. Okay. Why can't we all just be the same? (laughs) (laughs) Why does erotic fan fiction need two versions? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And by the way, again, I'm cutting you off. I have read a little bit of fan fiction on this most of it to to be honest i couldn't go through it because it's really long like i'm always amazed when someone writes you know 50 60 100 thousand words on on something that very few people are going to read but i did i did read a couple of the um somewhat erotic ones they were kind of funny well that's that's nice but i actually think there was a period of time where these were maybe not for hundreds of thousands of people but there were probably groups of hundreds to thousands of people who were purchasing or trading these books back and forth. It seemed to have grown into like a, a my little community of people who really did were passionate about it. So I kind of made a few notes on some of the stuff I found in this in this sort of fan fiction kind of world. Um, one thing I really liked reading about was apparently slash fiction, as we know, is a fairly popular form of fan fiction. But I didn't realize some of these things that were published, and I found them because they were involving Space Mode Beyond, but a lot of slash fiction did anthologies. So you'd buy one book, and it would be like, there'd be a story about how Hawks and McQueen were hooking up. But then you'd also get in that same sort of uh, package, you know, what you'd expect, a uh, Star Trek Next Generation, an X-Files. But then you'd also get an ER slash fiction, a Nash Bridges slash fiction, a Do South slash fiction. Hmm. There can't be a lot of due south uh, fiction or slash fiction, I suppose. I found it. Wait, wait, hold on. Wasn't okay. I don't really know due <laughs> south very well. But wasn't just him and a dog? No, no. He had his uh, partner call him Keith Rennie. Was he was the partner in that show? Yeah. <laughs> oh, see, I don't remember. Uh, but one was an American, one was a Canadian, and like, why are they fighting? Why are they both right? Yeah, exactly. One says sorry all the time, and one is. Uh, uh... It's so pa- it's so painfully Canadian. I wrote down three of my favorite titles for some of these fan fictions. One was called 265 Different Kinds of Cheese. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. That's going to be hard to beat, yeah. Uh, do you know what it was about? I'm I'm assuming v- a variety of cheeses. Uh, wrong. McQueen and Hawks have to go into a tank ghetto in New York City to solve a mystery. Huh. Color me surprised. I'm going to have to cut this up a bit. <laughs> Sorry. I realized I only wrote down one title. I didn't have multiple titles to tell you. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how you can fix that now. Jordan, let me tell you my favorite fan fiction title I read. Okay, what is it? And I'll cut that in later, so it sounds <laughs> like I see what I'm talking about. 
But yeah, a lot of these stories seem to focus on McQueen and Hawks. They definitely were like the characters people love the most. And the one thing I read that I was very excited about was in one of the slash fictions, someone had written a review. So I got to read the review of the fan fiction. Oh, weird. And the person who was reviewing it just couldn't get over the fact that in this particular story where McQueen and Hawks were hooking up, that McQueen was a virgin. And they just kept talking on and on about how impossible it was that McQueen could have possibly been a virgin. Because, because he's too handsome? I guess so. They, they were really hung up on this one thought. Well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's kind of hard to believe. Those piercing blue eyes. He is very handsome. Yeah. He's probably the most handsome person on the show. What do you think? Do you think so? Oh, very easily. I think he was Courtney's favorite. 100%. Yeah. Well, there we go. There we go. He's the handsomest person on the show. There was also one kind of small fan endeavor where they tried to create a virtual season, sort of a second season by the fans. They were basically writing stories. They would go episode to episode and kind of tell what a second season of the show would have been. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I went to the website, which was like very Geo cities esque and it doesn't look like they ever made it past the first episode. Yeah, well, I think they probably realize it's harder to write television than they thought. It was it was a good try, though. I liked, I liked the thought anyway. But while I was sort of digging deeper and deeper into these, like, fan wikis and, like, figuring this stuff out, I kind of dug up a piece of research that kind of goes into probably why the fan base grew so big for such a small show, that was something that didn't last very long. Okay. And now you'll have to bear with me. This is very confusing because I found this on a wikia for fan fiction and it was a comment in there was talking about how there was a live journal post from the mid 2000s that someone had made this comment on top of right and the person was talking about how when space Above beyond premiered aol was just starting to become a big thing in people's lives like american online was suddenly popping up in american homes with their 50 free hours so fans for the first time, kind of had a place to talk to each other about this kind of thing. So, you know, obviously that's a huge mobilizer for groups of people to get together. But in addition to that, one of the producers started joining in these chats, several of the cast, a whole bunch of the crew, and then like families of people who worked on the show. Right. So that very early uh, sort of version of the connection between the fans and, and the actual people who made the show, you know. Yeah, which really does kind of explain, I think, in some ways why there's really avid fan base still exists, like people really connected with it because it felt like they were part of the process. Right, right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that's about it for what I kind of dug up. I don't know if you've seen anything else of interest while you've been digging around, but... Yeah, mostly just uh, mostly just drawings of guns and ships. There's a whole lot of that. It doesn't take much to find a ton of people who have very lovingly done detailed drawings and specs of ships and guns. I like that McQueen toy you found. Oh yeah, I, I it doesn't look like it was ever finished though. So uh, that, that that was put on Instagram. I know I could I kept trying to find like a final version, but it was just like in progress. And then it, I just don't think it ever got finished. It's sitting sad on someone's shelf right now, just collecting dust. Oh, that's too bad. Maybe you can make one for me for Christmas. I could. That's true. I could. I was still kind of thinking about those Tech War mugs, but I I could do that. <laughs> oh, I want those Tech War mugs too. I want yeah. them both. Yeah. All right. Don't, don't be greedy. All right, let's get let's get into this week's episodes. Yeah, please. Here's the summary for episode 12. Who monitors the birds? Promised a discharge from his sentence to the Marines. Hawks is recruited for an assassination mission deep behind enemy lines. That summary was courtesy of boltax.blogspot.ei forward slash 2011 forward slash 07 forward slash bish dash review dash space dash above dash and dash beyond underscore 29 dot html wow that's a uh, um I, I wonder what his passwords are like <laughs> and let me let's just say right off the bat um and this might be a little embarrassing i, I quite like this episode however it took me way too long to realize that it was hawks i actually didn't know it was him i will just say this is pretty much a hawk solo episode and i didn't know for a good chunk of the episode that it was hawks just because of two reasons one he has his hair cut and two he's wearing goggles for a lot of it and i just didn't recognize him and I, like i literally have notes i'm like who is this person that's very funny i was gonna say that too is he got a haircut this episode looks so much better yeah he does look better he they cleaned him up 
Not that he looked bad before, but he looks really good now. Yeah. We're, we're, we're both supportive of the haircut. He's a real snack. He's real what? A real snack. Is that an expression? I don't know. I just heard it. I think it's things kids are saying. Are they really? He's a real snack? Yeah. Wow. Kids are weird. They're also, what are you do that, do? They're also doing that floss dance a lot. <laughs> I have my niece show me the floss dance. I've heard about this. I have no idea what it looks like. It's stupid. It's stupid. Do it for me. I, I can't. I can't. You have to be young and nimble. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, the episode starts off with a bit of a recap about tank mythology. They kind of give us a clip show and Hawks does a VO kind of explaining what tanks are and how they work and how they fit into this universe. I, I had a theory about this and, and I don't know how we're going to verify this, but my theory was this was a bit of a mid-season episode and this was a hope of getting more viewers in and they were just like, well, let's just tag on what the show is because that's what it felt like to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's been off for a, a couple of weeks. Let's uh, have a little recap for any new viewers coming on. Well, I can tell you right now how we can verify it. This is the first episode after the Christmas episode. They went on Christmas break. Oh, so so I think I'm right. Yeah, you're 100% correct, I think. I mean, that's I, probably part of the reason. I think the other part is this episode is nearly entirely silent. I know. I, I And that's what I liked about this. It's it's not quite, but it it is, I think... This is a show as a whole that has tried a few different sort of narrative techniques. And in this case, they really nailed it. Yeah, they did a pretty good job with it. I, I'm sure you saw the same trivia online. But apparently this is the episode, this particular episode of television inspired Josh Whedon to write Hush on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, his entirely silent episode there. Oh, I did see that. Yeah, apparently it was du- a direct relationship to this episode. I mean, this one isn't entirely silent. There's some talking just because there was no way to tell some of the story, I think. But they really went to a lot of effort to just be like, no one talks. There's only one character. We just do it all with action. Yeah, and and I and again, I think this was pretty effective. I would agree. Uh, I would agree with that. So as the show sort of begins, we meet uh, this older special ops guy named uh, Colquitt. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's a good way to pronounce it, I guess. They, they keep doing close-ups of the name, but I don't even remember if they say it, but Colquitt. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is one of the few parts where they talk, but no one ever pronounces his name. But I guess he is on the Saratoga. He watches Hawks at the firing range, and I guess Hawks is just a natural talent with a gun. Sure, why not, right? I don't know if we've yeah. ever heard that before, but there you go. He was really good at shooting that uh, Chig target in the shooting range right in the heart. I did love that, though, for a couple of reasons. One... Like it's just great that they made uh, target practice and the, and it, it's shaped like a chig. I I just think that's great. And also, I don't know why they have to keep shooting in the heart. I'm assuming it doesn't have the same uh, physiology as a human, but it, they just keep shooting in the heart. When we go to a gun range, can we get those printed up? I it's funny. I'm pretty sure I found it at some point, so I think I have it in the bowels of my computer. I have it, so we'll have them printed up. Go to a gun range and pretend we're uh, I don't know Hawks and uh, McQueen having our love affair. Yes, finally. The something for the slash fans of the show. <laughs> yeah, who, who are you? Are you McQueen? Or are you a uh, Hawks? Who do you want to be? Uh, I'll be I'll be Hawks. I like his new haircut. Okay, I'm You're I, happy with that. I, I'm fine. I'll, I'll I'll be the more old and weathered person. I mean, you've got that gray beard. That's true. You're perfect, McQueen. Yeah, all right, thank you. Those icy blue eyes. I think we've taken this far enough. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll we'll leave it there. Fair <laughs> enough. We're all getting a little hot and bothered now. Yeah. Well, there's so much stuff to talk about in this episode. Anyway, Colquitt basically offers Hawks a secret mission. His partner's been killed. He needs to go down to this planet and kill a high-ranking Chig official, the guy they think commanded the Vesta attack. And if Hawks will come with him, it's completely classified. He'll never be able to tell anyone, but he will give Hawks an honorable discharge from the military, basically negating his court sentence. And here's a couple things, and, and I might have missed this, but why did it have to be a secret mission? Was there anything really that, like, because they, they were doing something illegal? I guess, I, I'm not sure why it had to be a secret. Maybe it is uh, a war crime. No one seems to care about war crimes, but yeah, I don't know why it had to be a secret. It just seemed to be something they needed to keep under wraps. I, I just assumed it was like a black ops thing. I don't know. Right. Yeah. It just seemed like one of those things like, you can't tell anyone. And he's like, okay. And, th- and they're like, just because... I mean, it's not really important. The whole point is, it's just to have him out there by himself. And the idea is to raise the tension because no one really knows he's there. So if he dies, no one's going to know what to do or that he 
you know, even what planet he's on. But it, the reason why they're sending him doesn't really isn't explained at all. No, no, he's just was recruited and now they're going down. It opens on Planet Tigress in this very cool sequence where they climb out of the water like a couple of uh, like what was the term I'm looking for? Navy seals. Yeah, it was like a scene from like Apocalypse Now or something with uh, what's his face coming out of the water. It was it was good. I thought it looked really good. They really played with some of like classic cinematic military references, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I should say right off the bat, I think this is by far the most chigs we've ever seen. This episode is just rife with chigs. Am I am I not right? They're making up for episodes of no chigs for ages. Well, it's just amazing because there's like they've sort of had them be a lot of sort of like an almost faceless enemy for a lot of this. And we didn't really know about them or and you get hints of stuff. But this episode, like it's right out there. This is all hand to hand combat and they're on the same planet and it's just killing each other. They get into it right away. Like Colquitt and Hawks immediately get the drop on these three guys. They seem to complete their assassination mission in the first like three minutes of this show. Right. And then, it, and then it's just trying to get out. And then, yeah, they're basically trying to walk off to the extraction point. Another team of Chigs come across them um, and they kind of get fired upon. Colquitt gets killed and uh, Hawks has to kind of bury him in the dirt. But now it's up to Hawks to get off the planet himself. And that's basically the setup for the episode. Let me ask one thing. I noticed in this, it happens a few times. Every time um, they kill a Chig, it looks like almost like they're just releasing the air out of their suit. Is that what's happening? Are they just releasing the air into the environment? Or is that just like a cool effect that they die and like sort of thing no i think it's their suits are pressurized for their particular environment so when they like would cut a hose or like pull off something it, i think it's the atmosphere escaping and them dying because they turn to goo i guess in oxygen rich atmospheres right okay that's my guess anyway did you notice that the chigs have new ammo in this episode no i didn't up till now everyone has just shot you know standard tv bullets like it's just flares and you never see what the ammo is mm-hmm but in this one, they were like shooting glowing yellow plasma balls. The Chigs were. There were a lot of like sort of laser fighting in this episode, like a ton of explosions, a ton of just firefight. It was it was a really actually fun adventure episode. Yeah, it, the episode is mostly at from this point on a bit of a cat and mouse game. There are basically patrols everywhere on the planet trying to find Hawks, presumably because he's just assassinated a high ranking official. and They're just trying to get to him. And it's very funny, too, because there also seem to be just, like, bombing the entire planet indiscriminately to mm-hmm. get him. Yeah. Yeah, they're really, for whatever reason, they really they really want to get him. I think it actually, for me, I realized there's not a lot for Hawks to do in this episode. It might have been nice for them to move the assassination midway into it. Like, it's the goal is done right at the start. So finding stuff for Hawks to do now becomes a bit of a struggle for the episode. Well, what what the main thing seems to be is he keeps checking his computer screen to get to the what, what extraction would, point. The extraction point. So they keep doing that. And he's like, you know, every time he looks, the computer's like, sorry, not close enough, not close. Enough. So that's basically where it is. He's, he knows he just needs to get closer. And that's, that's the basic, I guess, uh, bit of tension that the episode gives. Yeah, he'll lose it for a few, for one act, and then get it back at the end of one, that second act. And then when he gets back his comms device, the satellite's out of range, so now he has to wait for the satellite to come back in to get a, an extraction point. So it's kind of always him struggling with a way out. It is, it's funny, though, because they mention when he goes down the mission that he only has 72 hours to do it. But I don't think they ever actually show that he has 72 hours, like, on the computer screen or anything. So they sort of mention it and then just go back. And it could have been a nice thing of, like, you know, a time ticking down or something. Like, he's running out of time to get there. But that just wasn't really done. I mean, this is really nitpicky, but they show that little comm screen a lot, the extraction point comm screen. And it is always November 11th on that comm screen. Oh, yeah. No matter yeah. what day it is. And, and, he, and he clearly does spend more than one day there. Yeah, he's there minimum one day. In fact... He really does look at it at like 2.49 in the morning one day. And then the next morning, he looks at it at like 1.22 in the morning. Still the same day. It's got the old uh, Jake Cardigan effect. Remember when uh, Jake would keep looking at his uh, his phone in his hand and it clearly was just a still image that they, they superimposed the video on? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, there's a point early on when he's being chased by Chiggs. He kind of dives into the lake again to get, kind of get cover from their fire. And to this point, we transition into kind of the B plot of this story which is the Hawks origin story. Here's the thing about this, and and as we're being nitpicky, so Hawks gets his hair cut now in this 
current time. So the the most recent version of Hawks has got his haircut, but in the past he has his haircut, and and I and I that's fine. You know, he, he had a different haircut at some point, but it was one of those weird things where I was like, why didn't you just not have him have that hairdo in one of those two time periods so you could really differentiate the same? Seeing as he's getting a haircut anyways. My guess is over Christmas break, he was like, I'm not wearing this mullet anymore. I'm getting a good haircut. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Sorry. In the past, he has the same haircut as he decided at like when he was young at 18, he was getting a haircut and then he grew his hair. Out, and then again, for this episode, he went, yeah, you know what? I'm going back to that 18 year old haircut. In your perfect world, uh, baby Hawks, that's what I call him in the flashbacks because he's a newborn. You prefer he had a rat tail of some sort. Um, Or just bald. He should have come out bald. Anyways, we, we digress. <laughs> yeah we actually see hawks born oh it's amazing it's it's one of my favorite things on the show it's like a big slime birth it's disgusting he like i guess comes out one of those tubes we've seen tanks in down this slide just covered in like white milky goo yeah it's gross it's great and as he hits this tray at the bottom of the slide the doctors kind of walk around him and they cut the umbilical cord on the back of his neck yeah it's all gross. It's it's wonderful. It's a very um it's not like Cronenberg, but it's it's in that in that general area. It, it yeah, you're right. It could have gone a little further, but it could have easily been totally Cronenberg. Yeah. And it was I I thought it I thought it was great. I wish the show did more stuff like this. And we get to see a bit about Baby Hawks and his time at the tank school they've mentioned before. And it's kind of interesting is what we learn about tanks is they kind of live in this sort of I guess like 1984 retraining camp sort of thing. Like the first classroom we see them in, they're just watching a slideshow that's basically telling them like how to how to live their lives and what's going on. But it's all done in, via slides. Yeah, all, all their education seems to be. I don't know what what year would this have been because he's now in his you're seemingly in his 20s in in real life. So this is at least 10 years previous. So I don't know what year that'd been. 2030 something. Apparently, apparently slides are all big. He's eight years old. Oh yeah, he's okay. So he's eight years old. So eight years previous. I don't know what this show takes. Anyways, slides slides make a real big comeback, is what I'm saying. But what we kind of learned from this slideshow is a tanks kind of have this group of people who take care of them. They're called their monitors. They're I guess basically their their bosses. Right. And the monitor's job is basically to like take away their free will, which as the slide says, to, to free them from the quote burden of choice. mm Hmm. Yeah, because you know, you know what happens when you give people uh, too much choice? They end up uh, silicates, gambling away all their money. It's true. They've burned once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It basically says the tank's job is basically to just react, but specifically to react how America wants them to react. The sense I got here, and maybe we'll see what your, th- your thinking is, but there was a bit of an anti-America feeling here. Would you Would you not agree? I mean, from the perspective of the writers, sort of this anti-nationalistic, raw, raw U.S. sort of thing. It certainly gave me pause because at some point it says who the tanks are being trained to fight. And obviously I was like, oh, you're being trained to fight silicates. That's what we've been told. But the slides come up and they're like, you're here to fight America's enemies, silicates, terrorists, and subversives. Right. Which is like a very dictatorial thing to say subversives is just something you say when you are a dictator right so do you think they're implying then that the intentions originally to create the the tanks was maybe a little more nefarious than we've been led to believe to this point well maybe wonder is america in this show we've never really seen how it works we've seen how the world government works but is america a little bit of a dictatorship yeah i don't i don't know you're right we all we've seen is uh well we've seen the party national or whatever they're called I think that was it. And uh, yeah, the world leaders, but we haven't seen the United States. So who knows what the, uh, you know, after those Brazil wars, we don't know what happens. It wasn't in Guatemala, it was in the Brazil wars and tech wars. Yeah, I, I, just, I just I just picked the war I remembered, but it was the, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, assume, I assume these all take place in the same universe, don't they? Oh, I, I, I think you're right. Somewhere on Earth right now, Jake Corgan's running around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Jake. This will be in our fiction, our fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Slash fiction. At the end of this slideshow, they kind of get into finally get into a lesson plan for the tanks. And the slide says, there are 687 methods of killing a human being. Yeah. I never know when, they, when you hear that sort of thing. It sounds cool. But then I'm like, how does that work? Like, if I, if I strangle you face to face and then I strangle you from behind, is that two different things? Well, I mean, at that many, that specific a number, they must have found out what the finite number of ways of killing a person right. was. Hmm. 
Can you name five? You've already done two. Um, uh, uh, bashing you over the head. Three. Um, stabbing. Four. Shooting. <laughs> I guess. Is five. That yeah, thank good you. Good job, Jordan. I, you you know passed what, I got school. very nervous about that. I was like, oh, I can't think of ways to kill humans. <laughs> And the next slide, which I thought oh, was the Oh, banana funniest. peels. Banana peels. <laughs> you can slip on a banana peel. Sorry, <laughs> keep going. The next slide after this, which I thought was the funniest one, because they're like, we're going to show you this Madrid of ways to kill a human being. And the first slide is a picture of a hand with a bunch of points on it. I'm like, how many ways are the kill person using just yeah, their it was hand? Like, it was like a weird like pressure point thing. Like, hit them on their thumb. So, yeah, so there's tanks are learning a lot of great ways mm. to kill someone. But but the overall point, as we said, the overall point is to learn that they're clearly getting indoctrinated in a in at least a, a very kind of violent way. It, it's not the normal school as we've been led to believe. It's not like the school that you and I may have went to. No, you're correct. That's kind of the idea as we kind of get this idea of where tanks come from and how that mythology works in a more detailed perspective. Jumping back to Tigris now, where Hawks is kind of on the run from these chigs. As he's kind of hiding, he, he manages to break his gun because it's just like there's too much fire going on. And he's sort of hiding underneath these bricks, not bricks, these boulders. And it's the first time I guess we get, would you call this a hallucination he uh, has? I don't, <laughs> here's the thing. It is so weird. And it almost, I felt it didn't work with the episode. And it's my least favorite part. And so what it is, is... For whatever reason, it keeps coming up, and maybe it is a hallucination. I didn't even know it was Vanson at one point, but a very white, kind of pale Vanson shows up, wearing not much, and kind of being very, I guess, seductive. But she also looks like she's dying; like she looks, it, she doesn't look good. And but for whatever reason, she's accompanied by like wailing electric guitars. That was my favorite part. Every time she shows up, and I was just like, "What? what is happening? I, I assume they meant it was some sort of hallucination and for some reason, but I don't know if even by the end of the episode, I understood what the point of it was. It wasn't like, I just didn't understand. It just was weird. Did you get it? I, I think I did. Uh, I, I, I called her in my notes, uh, Sexy Zombie Vanson. Right. <laughs> because, yeah, her old point was she would show up when hawks was in a bad position and she would very much like a siren try to lure him to her but i think she was whether she's a hallucination or physical or just an idea that hawks was grappling with is i I think he's supposed to be the embodiment of death oh okay because anytime he was in a tough spot she would call to him and like kind of entice him to maybe give up because he was so far behind enemy lines there was his computer either was lost or telling him there's no satellite signal. There just seemed to be no way out for him. So when she arrived, it seemed to be sort of this idea that like, maybe you should give up Hawks. Like maybe you should just give it and die. And it's supposed to be a seductive idea. Hence they used Vanson who we're really starting to see now. He really does have the hots for. Right. I'm on board with that. I just think it was so weird. It just like, she just would show up and be like, sitting all cross all weird and and then like electric guitars and i was like stop it it was a cool adventure stop having her show up those cool rotted teeth of hers yeah and yeah one part she like opens her mouth and like crap's coming out it was <laughs> gross but not cool gross like the old slime birth did did this remind you a little bit though when she first showed up because the first time you see her she's up on the hill and she's sort of backlit and she's i don't know if she's doing a sexy dance i can't remember but it reminded me of do you remember in star trek 5 where I can't remember her name, what the character's name is, uh, uh, Ahura, and she does like a sexy dance, and it's supposed to be like, ooh, can you believe it? But like, to be fair to Ahura, she was like nearly 60 when she did the movie, so it was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling here. <laughs> Anyways, it reminded me a little bit of that. It was very funny. I kept thinking it like looked like something out of uh, like an Aerosmith video or something, really backlit, but explosions were highlighting her. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, I, I, it, it was my, again, I've said it was my least favorite part of this episode. I mean, it's fair. It is, uh, never really explained and feels more like something from a David Lynch film than it does like something from this show. Yeah, agreed. Anyway, back to the reality of what's going on, I guess, is he has no gun now. He's still on the run from these chigs. He actually managed to overtake one because there's just like squads of them everywhere. He kills this one. He kind of comes with a kind of good plan. He's going to like steal his armor and kind of dress up as a chig and try to get away with like or hide amongst them. Yeah, that was great. He tries putting on his helmet. 
which was interesting. It actually almost chokes him out, but I guess it's because it's trying to pump their weird atmosphere into his lungs. Right. Was that was that what it was? Oh, yeah. It was like he put it on, and I thought, oh, I don't. I thought there would be some reveal like it fits perfectly for a human or something. But he just like he had to take it off immediately. That's what it was. It was try to give them whatever their filter for oxygen is. Yeah. Well, it started making a noise, and it seemed to like grip around his neck or something I, yeah i thought they were gonna do something similar like yeah they're just like humans he can wear their armor but in reality it was more like you're not suitable for this right there's also another little thing because he picks up the gun and tries to fire it and seems to have trouble with it until he points it at the ground near his foot and then it does fire mm-hmm. do you think that is because the chig guns are engineered in a way they only fire at human biosigns I think that's that's an interesting idea, and you could be right. I just thought it was sort of like similar to when they were trying to fly the ship. I just think it's not as simple as just pulling a trigger. I think there was a bunch of mechanics involved that he just didn't know how to use. But he does discard the gun right away. Yeah, it seemed like he figured out how to shoot it, but he did throw it away right away. I don't know. I, I just I chose to read it that way. Well, I, you, I don't know. We'll, 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 the, the show has been pretty good at slowly peppering things in that we learn about later they've done a very good job so maybe that'll be something that comes back yeah but without a gun now he kind of doubles back to colquitt's grave and uh digs out his gun from from his grave they left him there with was that what it was he, he dug it he dug it i can't remember he he dug it out of that other guy clip shit is that what it was colquitt yeah he, he goes back to that guy's grave and kind of gets his gun right so he, I, it was a little confusing because you don't fully understand that he doubled back. It seems like he's been walking in a straight line, though. I, I thought the same thing. I thought it w- what was going to be was that he realized he was going in circles. But I was like, oh, he had the guy. He buried the guy's gun for some reason. Yeah. We get a flashback now to Baby Hawks at Tank School. And I guess their bunks at Tank School, are they pretty much look like a prison. Yeah. And he's staring at the bars of the window and he kind of sees a bird flying up in the air above him. Hawks is very interested in this bird. So when he goes to class that day, uh, do you do you remember this conversation he has with his monitor during uh, tank class? Yeah, uh, he oh, doesn't he ask who monitors the bird? Is that what he asks? Yeah, he asks who monitors the birds. He doesn't say it like that though. He has a real childlike innocence to him. Who right. monitors yeah. the birds? Well, yeah, what it is is they're in class, and I think someone asks if there's any questions, and he's the only one who has a question, which seems to be something that. Oh, no, they don't even ask him any question. He just raises his hand, something that seems to be uh, not very common in school anyways. And they're sort of like, well, why is someone asking a question? And that's his question. It's who monitors the birds. And immediately uh, they all sort of start, all the teachers or prefects or whoever they are, sort of uh, start giving each other looks of like, oh, this one's a troublemaker. Well, they actually have an answer for him. I think it's his second question that gets him in trouble. So what's the answer for the first one? When he asks who monitors the birds, the monitor says, I monitor the birds. And then Hawks immediately follows up that question with, who monitors you? Right. Oh, yeah, right. And then they're all like, oh, wait a minute. We got one of those uh, troublemakers. He's seen as defective, quote unquote. And in fact, one of the other tanks writes him a little note to warn him that uh, he overheard the monitors talking and they're going to have him erased. Right. And and erased, I assume, just means just kill. I would assume so, too. Because that night, one of the monitors comes and tells him to come to the med bay. Uh, They've think he's getting sick and they need him to like they need to check him out kind of thing yeah it really seemed like he was gonna get molested oh man it it really did have like a one of those awful catholic school kind of vibes yeah it's like oh come to me come with by myself it's late at night come out over here yeah make sure to wear the little outfit that has a slit in the back is that is that how it happened at school well it does at tank school unfortunately it's a real problem <laughs> But this is actually, this has been teased in earlier episodes. This is the human that Hawks has killed in his past. Right. Yes. Which again, I think, which we mentioned before, the show's been pretty good at, they drop little bits of information and then come back to it, not even the next episode, several episodes later. And so, yeah, they mentioned in the episode where he was under the little, uh, what, what do you call it? Mind comp? What was the test the, uh, that they had to do uh, in that one episode? Void comp. I know it's not mind comp. Voinkov, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Um. Anyways, they he did that test and they mentioned that he killed someone. So this was it. He killed this guy. Yeah. He kind of takes a scalpel and stabs this guy to death and kind of escapes from Tank School, um, which is why he never learned about Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, he didn't know that was the next day's class was on Christmas. 
he could have saved himself so much hassle yeah that's funny though yeah i forgot he, he didn't learn about christmas it's just weird because they seem to be mostly just teaching them about how to kill people i don't know when christmas was going to come around yeah but this basically lays out his whole origin story we kind of now know everything we need to know about hawks yeah he didn't finish school and but i guess somehow he still got into the military but they knew he didn't finish tank school it is very strange i had i had some questions about that and maybe it'll come up later when he was arrested in philadelphia they got him sentenced to the marines is he arrested for the murder of this teacher this monitor that was my guess yeah and it's interesting maybe because there are tank rights now he wasn't like sentenced to prison they sent him to the marine corps as some sort of like conciliatory thing anyways well because i mean that's that's what they've uh uh outlined is that the whole point of the mission is that he's going to have this expunged from his record but so i i, I think you're probably right with your theory yeah it, you know it's a mostly silent episode so they have nowhere to get into it but that was my guess anyway we jump back to hawks on tigris and much like when he was in tank school he looks up and he sees this huge pterodactyl flying in the sky was it a pterodactyl? I mean, that's what it looked like to me. It's it's a weird alien bird. Yeah. I'm just saying, he didn't go into the past. Right. I mean, we don't know that. Uh, top secret yeah. mission. It's true. It's a top secret mission. Maybe he did go into the past, but he didn't. He just saw a weird alien bird. But while he's looking at this alien bird, he catches sight of a chig very close to him. And he's going to kill this chig until he notices that the chig is also kind of looking up and watching this bird with the same sort of awe that he had for it. And you know what I, I liked about that? They've given hints that there's more to the Chigs than we've generally seen. And it started with the not very good at Christmas episode where they clearly let them get away, the Chigs. And there's been hints of it throughout. And this was another one that there's maybe more to the Chigs than we've previously been led to believe. And and this episode has a few more moments. But this is kind of the first one of like, oh, they also want to just, you know, sit and look at birds and, you know. There, there, there's there's more personality there than we thought anyway they can appreciate the wonder of the world yeah exactly yeah that's much more succinct than what i was trying to mumble out but you're right as you alluded to in the next scene he gets cornered by a bunch of them but he manages to kill most of them and then he and one of the chigs get in a sort of hand-to-hand grapple and fall off the side of a hill and when they get to the like finish tumbling down the hill the chig he's with starts begging for mercy non-verbally obviously but he's kind of like asking hawks not to kill him yeah it, i thought it was a really a really good scene i it it just was like it was the two people they're both kind of desperate and they just agreed to not only not kill each other but sort of weirdly give each other mementos yeah uh, much like in the pilot this chick takes off that little like circuit board on his chest whatever it is and offers it to hawks and then hawks kind of trades him a ring for it I liked it because no one was saying anything. So it just sort of was like, you just got the idea. What They're just having a truce and they both, without saying anything, kind of understand each other. And I, I thought it was really well done. Yeah, it definitely, it's interesting because I wonder how this will affect Hawks moving forward. Because he, he'll have a greater empathy now, I think, for these soldiers than perhaps anyone else in the squad. W- weren't you surprised, though, that when they were giving each other gifts, don't you think he, uh, the chick would have given him some poop? Well, I uh, I assumed when uh, the Chig let his guard down that Hawks would have yelled, bend over, Chiggy Man. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Bend over, Chiggy Man. <laughs> oh, that is good. That's his, that's That may be the best thing this show has done. Bend over, Chiggy Man. <laughs> but yeah, they, uh, they do a truce and they go their separate ways. And Hawks is kind of patching himself up from the fall because he's got a little, he's bleeding a little bit and he's hiding still because this is the whole episode. It's just him hiding. Yeah. Which is maybe one of its biggest weaknesses is not a lot happens, but he kind of sees another patrol coming toward him. So he uses his uh, human stink blood. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right there. What are they called? The stink, stink, stink animals. What do they call them? A uh, red stink creature. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> but he uses his blood basically to like, lay a trap for this new squad that's coming at him and when they kind of step up and find his blood he he gets to jump on them drowns one of the chigs stabs the other one to death and as he's kind of sitting there in the aftermath he looks down at the chig that he's just drowned and and it's his friend it's his old uh, chig friend yeah he's killed his only chig friend i thought it was going to be a bit of a like a hue moment 
you know, like in uh, uh, Star Trek Next Generation when they, they befriend that Borg and send him back? I thought that's what this was going to be, that they were going to change the Chigs in some way by sending someone back who had had a little bit of... Sympathy? Would been, yeah, he's a sympathy or he's been humanized, humanized a little bit, but that's not what happens. He just He's like, yes, we're friends. Now I immediately kill you. I mean, there is, and there's a bit of a somber moment. He clearly feels bad about it and, you know, gives the guy back his little circuit joystick thing on his chest but i mean that's it that's the end that's the end of that chig but you're right uh, it is a somber moment and like it is sad actually it's kind of a bit of a sad moment because it really breaks hawks because mm-hmm. this whole journey has been very tough on him just survival wise but now he's kind of just killed the one friend he kind of made or the one ally or just the one moment of hope i guess and this is when he kind of looks up and it's becoming night again and more Chig transports are flying through the atmosphere. Like, they're really calling in reinforcements to get him. Like, whoever he assassinated, they just want the person who did it. Yeah, they really want to punish him. Yeah, and sexy zombie Vanson comes back and really starts kind of, like, convincing him it's time to die. Yeah, it's, she is, and she's so annoying. I, I didn't mind it, but... Oh, at this, I, I just really didn't like it. At this moment, he flips open his comms computer, and the satellite's back in range, and he gets a new extraction point. And uh, sexy zombie Vanson, like, is very sad as he walks away. She almost had him. She almost drug him to, Mm -hmm. I don't know, the afterlife of this planet. Yeah. And uh, as he walks off to climb back into the lake to swim off the extraction point, he takes out his honorable discharge, which he's been carrying with him this whole time. Yeah, I know. I I thought it was, well, because they showed it earlier, right? Like, uh... Uh, maybe yeah it, it is weird it's just like he just has it and then i don't know yeah i i my assumption is he brought it down on on the planet for some reason it looks like a certificate or a, like a graduation paper you'd get yeah but yeah and then he he tears it up because he's not leaving the marines he doesn't want this dishonorable discharge i guess i don't know what the point they're trying to make is like he's like after this experience i don't want it anymore i was like but you kind of did the mission i don't know does seem like he easily could have just held on to it and then when he was finished being in the marines he could have just had it yeah but he doesn't want it doesn't want it if he's gonna be honorably discharged it's gonna be for his bravery not his bravery on this planet doing this assassination (laughs) (laughs) yeah right but yeah that uh, that pretty much wraps up the episode it was a pretty good one Mm -hmm. i thought so too i don't think it always landed and i think if they had moved that assassination plot to kind of like further into the episode like they got there colquitt got killed now he had to complete this assassination without him i think they just might have given him a few more like beats to do as opposed to kind of spinning their wheels about him just like not having a a link to a satellite but overall a pretty good i like the silence it was good i thought it was weirdly kind of similar in structure to the west episode where uh the you know they're not dead whatever in that you kind of got they used sort of flashbacks to tell you what was kind of happening i just thought this was better executed it wasn't perfect but i thought this was better executed at least for the reason that we learned a little bit more about hawks which we didn't in the west episode you didn't learn anything about him in that episode yeah this definitely used the flashbacks more like an episode of lost where you got a deep backstory about the character right. as opposed to something directly related to the current plot and that was that so on to episode 13 let's do it uh here's the summary for episode 13 level of necessity so- I saw the 46th surrounded by these colors. I know it sounds weird. I mean, it was weird. At first I thought this is some new cheek weapon or maybe an electrical disturbance, but no one else saw it. And I I had the strongest feeling that things were wrong. I had to say something. You had a gut feeling? No, it was more than that. It scared me. Deep underground, the 58th are on the run from hostiles. They meet another squadron whose commander orders them to enter another tunnel. Damp House refuses and tells the 58th not to go because of a vision and a feeling. The other squad die. Could it be ESP? (laughs) I like that. That summary was courtesy of... Keith is me. Hey, that person did it before, right? Yeah, Keith is me is back. What what was that little rhyming line? What was it? The other squad die. Could it be ESP? Yeah, that's good. (laughs) If that's not poetry, I don't know what is. Fair enough. 
Uh, as the summary stated, the uh, 58th starts off the episode in these tight underground tunnels of the ominous planet Daedalus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of caves in this one. Is this is this kind of like a, a Vietnam tunnel episode? Actually, I think Courtney brought this up. It's not really clear what their specialty is. The uh, Crazy Hearts, what's their name? Wild Cards? The Wild Cards? I don't know why I call them the Crazy Hearts. Anyways, sometimes they're like parachuting in places. Sometimes they're underwater. Sometimes, so it's like they're a real multi-purpose sort of uh, fleet here. And for some reason, they're underground. I just would assume they would have a team that's a little better suited for this. But I guess they're just a multi-purpose kind of team. They're a real Swiss Army knife. Yeah, I guess. But yeah, they're, they're crawling through these tunnels. I guess they're fighting tunnel to tunnel with the Chigs here. They're a little lost, and they bump into another squad that uh, has found a passageway out of these tunnels. But before they climb into kind of this other tunnel to get out, Damp House starts seeing like a glowing purple aura over the entire other squad that they found. Like they're like, it's like they've got like, I don't know, a candy coating. It's a weird effect. It doesn't necessarily look bad. It just looks... Yeah, it just looks like a weird aura sort of thing. Yeah, it's just having some sort of premonition. And she she tells the 58th not to follow into the tunnel because something bad's going to happen. And as soon as this other squad climbs in this tunnel, you see like a chig hand like reach out from a hole and drop a grenade on them. Yeah, yeah it's funny. It was, it was a little bit of a Looney Tune moment. <laughs> but that's kind of the setup for this episode is that uh, Damp House has The Shining. <laughs> yeah it's true yeah it's it, the episode is i will just say there's parts of this i like and parts of it i don't like i thought it's an interesting idea that she might have this new power but doesn't it feel like we've had this episode where there's someone at being interrogated about something and they don't want to talk about it this has happened like five times now well i think this is very much like this next scene after the mission is mcqueen having a debriefing with damp house which is very much like the fear episode one where they're all in a debriefing about the previous mission. It feels like that episode was such a huge blunder. They've kind of taken elements of it and tried to reuse them to better affect another episodes. Oh yeah. Okay. I'll buy it. I don't know if that's true, but it does feel like they've used other elements of that episode in other places to some better effect. Right. Well, and it, it to, at least in this episode, there's very little of it. Yeah. And they have a conversation. McQueen says he's going to cover up for her disobedience of not following the order to go into the caves because, you know, it worked out for the best. And he kind of says he won't tell anyone. But then in his report, he files a report of anomalous intuition. Yeah, that was weird, right? He's like, I won't tell anyone. He's like, I'll just make it more vague. It's like, clearly people are going to have questions. Well, is that a, is that a regular classification, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, that's going to end up on Agent Mulder's desk. <laughs> well done. After this sort of briefing, she goes back to the wild cards bunk. And uh, this is the thing I really liked was uh, the squad got an ant farm. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. And I know why they did it. It was visually, they're like ants going through this ant, ant farm, these tunnels. And then they're like visually, they also have an ant farm. But it was a weird thing for them to be like, oh, yeah, by the way, they got one. I was really hoping it would come back in other episodes. We'll see what happens. But. If it's anything like my ant farm, those ants are going to die immediately. Well, I was thinking, I'm like, isn't it much worse if ants escape on a spaceship? Yeah, I don't, I, I just, I, the whole, the whole thing just doesn't make sense on a closer inspection. It just was a weird, not sight gag, but it's just that one visual to go, oh yeah, they're like ants. But it's like, I don't know why that's there. And I, I actually realized, I think I think it's bad idea to have ants on a spaceship because of that one Simpsons episode. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's the only reason I, I think that. So other than the ants, we kind of get to see there's two additional members of the 58th right now. There's Winslow, the woman who was in the Christmas episode, and maybe one other episode, the one that Courtney thought was a regular member of the squad. Oh, was it the same woman? It was. It was. She's been around for a little while now. I actually didn't recognize her, so bad on me. <laughs> she just got that knife that was engraved for Christmas. Oh, so that was her. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm 100% sure that was the same woman. And they also have adopted a squad member from that squad who just died in the tunnels. I guess one guy didn't die. Mm -hmm. This uh, this guy named Lubin, and he is not happy to be there. Yeah. Well, to be fair, it makes sense. His whole, all, every, all his friends are dead. Now he's been stuck with the group that he sort of blames for their death. And the squad kind of has this conversation now about what happened in the tunnels and this premonition that Dampus had. And kind of one of them states this idea that you, you can't cheat death. 
it really felt for a moment like these were the seeds to Morgan and Wong's later film, Final Destination. Hmm. The episode didn't end up going that way, but they even give this example where they're talking about a soldier who had a bad feeling about a, a fight that was going to happen because someone else had died in a similar flight. So he chose not to go on that mission. And instead, he went to get his hair cut. And while he was getting his hair cut, a plane fell on the building and killed him. Right. That you can't escape fate sort of thing. Yeah. Which is the entire premise of that movie franchise they started. So I, I was wondering if we were going to get further into that. But we just kind of get like this little glimpse of an idea that these guys had that they'd later come back to. Right. But it's at this moment that Agent Mulder does arrive. Oh, it's uh, it's old Richard Kind, right? I was so happy. I love Richard Kind. I, I, what, I, what I wrote is, Richard Kind's here. He's going to play a putz. He doesn't, though. No, he doesn't really, actually. This is the most authoritarian, tough character I've ever seen him play for a character who only seems to play annoying, whiny people. If you don't know who Richard Kind is, I'll give you the two things I know him from. Mad About You and Spin City. Yeah, that's his two big ones. Yeah, so uh, 90s sitcoms is his... Uh... He's in Curb Your Enthusiasm quite a bit, too. He's great. I, I was so happy when he when he stepped through that thing and he was going to be our Agent Mulder. I, I'm going to uh, disagree with you there. He's less Agent Mulder and he's more Professor X. Oh, it's a good point. He runs a PSYOP squad, which deals with like paranormal and supernatural abilities in soldiers, apparently. Yeah, he's trying to get he's trying to put together the X-Men. Yeah, uh, he I guess a little later on, people are seem to be aware of this PSYOP squad. It's not like an undercover thing. I guess they've been around in the military for a while. They sort of talk about how they're a bit disgraced because what is it? I wrote this down because I had to remember what exactly the details were. But like in 2052, some PSYOP squad member basically sent an entire armored unit through a valley pass and they were wiped out by the quote unquote CCs based on a bad vision that this mm-hmm. guy had about what was going to happen. So they've kind of been left with this bad reputation, his PSYOP squad. Right. I have a question, though. They mentioned it really quickly. Who do you think the CCs are? I don't know who that is maybe no not silicate credit card no don't know yeah i wasn't sure it seemed to imply there was this other war at some point but i i it's it's a little strange um the other thing i liked about richard kind is uh he had a big speech about how time is a circle and i was like oh true detective stole this from richard kind um what i liked was uh we're going to talk about i'm sure we go into a sort of almost like training montage sort of thing of him he, he goes through a lot of questioning of Dampoos. Like he's, he, what you find is he thinks she's got powers and he wants to exploit them in a positive way, you assume, as part of his team. But they go through a lot of him training her and, and questioning and asking questions. But I like it. Some of them are, it's just like, it's just him like flashing like cards. Like it's an X on a, on a screen or a little circle. And he's like, what do you see? What do you see? And it's just, I don't know. It just made me laugh. It just reminded me of the scene from, uh, uh, Ghostbusters when Bill Murray's character is doing that. Well, that's it. He's he's using the exact cards from the Ghostbusters movie. Like, that's exactly what it is. And then they do a little test on her for psychic abilities, like where they're having her try to guess what light's going to flip. And there's a really weird scene where he's grilling her, asking her questions about her past. Like, is this true about your past? Is this true? Like, where did you grow up? How many sisters did you have? Did your father touch you? Yeah, I know. And she's like, what? No. Uh, But it was really awkward. Like, he kept trying to, like, catch her with these got you questions or something. What they implied was that he was trying to catch her off guard so that she would open herself up in some way and be a little bit more uh, open to her environment. And so it was, like, catching her off guard so she wasn't wasn't thinking about things as much. But it was an odd strategy. Right. But uh, she does get her to actually have a psychic vision when he puts like what looks like eggs on her eyes yeah it's a funny look it looks it looks like it looks like you put two fried eggs on her eyeballs it turns out they say i they must have had to state it because it looked so insane because that's what i thought they were but like i guess there are ping pong balls and cotton or something i think yeah i think what it is is they had a not very good prop and then they just had to call call it out of how bad the prop was by her being like this just looks stupid doesn't it <laughs> but yeah he gets her to envision documentary about hawks he's playing on a dv in another room i guess so kind of proving that she has some ability to like be psychic why do you think she is so um adverse to admitting she has this power do you mean like she must clearly see some benefits of it if she can harness it but she's immediately her reaction is to either lie about it or pretend she doesn't have it 
I think she's just disconcerned. I mean, what we know about her is she's an engineer from MIT, and I guess maybe this supernatural idea is, is contrary to her worldview. Okay. All right. I'll buy it. Now, real quick, Jordan, I want to find out if you're psychic. Oh, okay. So what I've done is I've made up cards, much like much like the ones Dampus had to look at. I've got uh, a diamond. I've got squiggly lines. Mm-hmm. I've got a cross. Yep. I've got a star, mm-hmm. a circle. I really like your star, by the way. And a square. Okay, got them all. I'm going to hold one up. You clear your mind, Jordan. Okay. Clear your mind. Now, in your mind's eye, envision the symbol on the card I'm holding. The first card is a cross. Oh, my gosh. It's actually right. You got it right. Holy moly. All right, should we do another one? But see, no one's going to believe I actually got it right because they can't see. Well, I'm impressed. I'll be impressed. That's true, though. You did get it right. All right, let's do another one. All right, Jordan, clear your mind. There's a symbol on this card. Envision it. Envision what the symbol is. It's a square. It's a tri- or it's a diamond. You're very close, actually. Oh, I was close, yeah. Because it could look like a square. Well, all right. Well, I'm one for two. Well, I, we'll call it 1.5. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll take it. So I, I, I think Jordan's psychic. Yeah, that's all it takes. I love being very impressed with just really lucky things like that. I'm like, oh, yeah. Do you see how I do? Well, first guess, I got it. Tell, tell everybody you know. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm going to talk about at work tomorrow. Anyway, now that Richard Kind is kind of semi-proven that she's probably a psychic, the 58th gets called for a mission to go back down to the planet's tunnels. And their mission this time is to take out this munitions depot that the Chigs have in the planet. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's a mission they need to. <laughs> yeah, right. But Richard Kine is going to tag along. And he's going to try to photograph Dampus's powers. Yeah, which was weird because they've made it clear at this point that no one else can see it. So I don't know. He must have like a weird aura camera. Yeah, I guess maybe he just has built a special camera to catch to catch superpowers. He's like an annoying ghost hunter. <laughs> it's kind of true. And in the tunnels, Dampus looks around at her squad and uh, poor Lubin, the new guy, is already glowing purple. Hold on. Is his name is his name Lubin? Yeah, Lubin. What a terrible character name. They have weird names on this show. I guess Lubin. Ugh. He does die a horrible death, but not before he fakes her out by pretending to die a horrible death. Yeah. It's the old, like, can you believe uh, you thought I was going to die? And then eh, two seconds later, he's, he's killed. It was actually not a bad kill. Like, it was a bit of like a gruesome slasher movie kill. Yeah, how does he, how does he, do they grab him or something? What is it? He's the first one lowering himself into a lower oh, part of the yeah. tunnel. And it cuts into the tunnel beneath him. And all you see is like a chig arm and this huge knife come down, kind of like something from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then mm-hmm. while his like upper body is still like in the top tunnel, he just starts getting hacked at below. He, he really wishes he had, he'd met that other chig that is very nice and just wants your ring. Yeah, he just wants to trade you for a ring. A much better chick. Not this guy. But now that Lubin's died, she looks around, and the purple aura is jumping to every member of the 58th, Jordan. And she knows one more will die. Well, that's she's like, one more will die. But it's like, this aura is not very good, though. Like, it just bounces around, and she's like, well, someone's going to die. But it's like, but isn't the whole thing that she's getting a premonition or and that something's going to, it's going to become true? It's This doesn't seem to make sense. But anyways, sure, why not? It, it, what tension? They really broke their own rules right now. They yeah. They needed something to like raise the stakes, but I don't think this quite managed to land, but it's okay. Yeah. They find the Chig Ammo Depot, um, which was a set that I don't know how you felt about it. I actually kind of liked it. This I have to say, at this point of the episode, it raises my, my score of the episode. This is my favorite part of the episode. This is what I wanted it to be. Them going over and setting a bomb in this weird Doctor Who-esque sort of a, a, a scene. I said the set because it's like a big cave set with these huge like monoliths, which are these sci-fi ammo towers, which the chicks keep their ammo in, I guess. Yeah, I I liked it. I wish they did more stuff like this. It felt very Flash Garden-y or something to me. I was just like, in a good way, I was like, this is super cool. Yeah, I I agreed. I liked it too. So they sneakily set up all these charges so they can blow up the uh, ammo, I guess. And as they're doing it, uh, one of the chicks spots and a firefight breaks out. And while the shooting's going on, Richard Kind looks up, and now he's psychic, and he sees the purple aura around Dampus, 
Yeah. So was he psychic the whole time, or he's just he's hit his head into uh, aura land? I'm not sure. I I took it as he was so open to it that he finally like grasped the power that he's always mm. wanted. Mm. But I'm not sure. But it's not going to last long. No, because he uses the power to take a bullet for Dampos. Yeah, because he thinks she's important, I guess, even though her power sucks. <laughs> she can't tell who's going to die. It's too bad. It really should be on him. I was really hoping he would survive because I would I would have watched more of this PSYOP squad with Richard Kind. That would have been a great spinoff. It is a fun show. It's like, a, I mean, who knows what they're going to do in this? Maybe Dumpu's going to have powers. Maybe they're all going to find they have powers. But it is a fun little, a fun little twist. Yeah. Anyway, they escape the tunnel. It all explodes. There's a fun shot of them crawling through tunnels as an explosion creeps up behind them. And we kind of end the episode on another debrief between McQueen and Dampus, where he gives her the photographic evidence that uh, Richard Kine managed to snap off her psychic powers. And she kind of has a choice to make, I guess, whether she'll destroy it and no one will ever know she has them or whether she keeps it and maybe she like... I guess the idea is... She doesn't have to decide now whether she wants to embrace this power, but she's going to keep the photographic evidence in case she wants to in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I guess we'll we'll find out more about her psi powers another day. I'm sure they're going to come back to it. I mean, that's pretty much wraps up the episode. I I will say I liked it. I was happy Dampus finally got an episode. Yeah, that's true. She uh, uh, the only thing I would say is we didn't really learn anything else about her. They've just added like a power. You know what I mean? They haven't done much with her. We don't know very much about her back history. She has had very little to do in these episodes. I'm actually okay with her having a cool psychic power. Like, yeah, I think that's kind of a cool character for one of these characters to have. So I was happy they gave her something to do and something to set her apart from the rest of the squad. So I agree. overall, I was happy to watch the episode. It's just been weird. They've so underutilized her for so much. Like this is episode, what, 11? No, no, it's episode 13. Man. And I mean, even Wang's had almost two episodes now. I agree. Yeah, she's been an underutilized character. So I hope this bakes, I don't know. Gives her a little bit more to do. Gives, gives her something to do, maybe. Uh, all right. I mean, do you have anything else you want to get into? Or you want to rate these? Yeah, let's just rate them. What do you think of uh, who monitors the birds? Okay, I'm probably going to give a higher score than you, but I'm going to make a note before I even give you my score. It will lose a point for electric guitar, goth, dead zombie Vanson. So I'm giving it a 7.5. It would have been higher. I actually really, I had a fun time watching this episode, but I, that, it just drove me crazy every time she showed up. So 7.5. Oh, wow. You're really taking it off for that that little mm-hmm. guitar riff. Yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> the guitar well, riff, yeah. It was really funny. I like that. Um, I mean, it was dumb, but it made me laugh. Uh, I'm going to give it a 7.5 as well, actually. Nice. I like it when we agree. Yeah, it wasn't a perfect episode. I think it could have been tighter and a little better plotted. But Mm -hmm. as far as an ambitious idea that was fairly well executed, it really was. Yeah. And then uh, what about level of necessity? In much in a similar way, but in an opposite way, I'm going to add a point because I really like the end of the episode with, like, as you're saying, that sort of Flash Gordon sort of set and that bomb. So I'm going to add a point for that and I'm going to give it a 6.5 because up to that point, I wasn't really feeling it. Oh, really? You know what? For me, it was a fun little adventure. I kind of liked the idea of the psyops. I liked the general tunnel setting i'm giving it a 7.5 wow wow that you gave the, you like those the exact same those two episodes huh yeah i i had a really nice time with both these episodes they weren't perfect but i was just like i would i would watch these if i caught them on television yeah i i agree that's that's a good way of explaining it and i think these were as we've seen before i think these were a big step up from the previous two episodes at least in my opinion no i think you're right uh, these were certainly more in line with the good work this show can do when it tries. Agreed. All right, Jordan, should I punch this stuff into the continued drag computer and make sure we're not jumping on the escape pod? Yeah, I'm, I know we're not. There's no way. I know. We're we're doing great on this show. Yeah, at best, we're going to do that little thing where they... Uh, remember that guy Remember the guy had to put the bomb and be in the same room to evacuate it? <laughs> right. Stand in the airlock and shoot it out the window? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the worst that's going to happen. <laughs> All right, Jordan. The series average right now? Six point five eight. Oh, so it went up a little bit. Went up a little bit. I mean, it had to. It was. It's pretty. It's pretty low still. So I. I think I agree with you. I think it's kind of surprisingly low. But then at the, when you kind of think about it, you're like, there's been as many weak episodes as there've been strong episodes. It's becoming clear and clear as to why maybe it didn't find an audience. Like if you yeah. tuned in on the wrong week, woof. Yeah, you get you get uh, old uh, Wes crying about his girlfriend or something. And you're like, oh, enough of this. Not for me, thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. 
but uh but that's it on to uh uh more episodes we're 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 da- da- going down the stretch now yeah we're we're over the hump it's all downhill to the end from here hopefully mm-hmm. uphill in episode quality though <laughs> agreed in the meantime you can email us at continue and drag at gmail.com and follow us on instagram at continuum drag to uh watch further adventures of the wild cards in gift format and i'm telling you now the the thing where he slides out of the the birth is great what's his name hawks oh cutting that umbilical cord wonderful yeah it's gross but until next time uh jordan good podcast and i'll, I'll see you next week bend over chicken man <laughs> every every time that's how we'll finish it Continuum Drag is recorded at Astro Lab Studios in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rick Siedler. Produced by Jordan Delick and Luke Black. Special thanks to Adam Wheatner, Jeff Hanley, and Dwayne Wright. <laughs>